everybody to Tuesday afternoon computer science. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ryan Williams. Uh, Ryan is currently at Stanford. He received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2007. Uh, and he's been around. He's been to Princeton, New Jersey, San Jose, California, where he was the Joseph Raviv Postdoctoral Fellow at IBM Allen Research Center. Uh, and he's going to talk to us on algorithms for circuits and circuits for algorithms. Thank you very much for the introduction. Sorry for the timer. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, I'm happy to be here. So I have several goals for this talk. Um, first, I want to describe some new developments that have occurred in complexity theory over the last uh, few years. And I'm all, I want to tell you about like new and possibility results have been proved. But um, they weren't developed in a vacuum, and they came out of thinking about some new connections between algorithm design, this algorithms for circuits problem, and circuits for algorithms, which is trying to model algorithms using circuits. So this is, title is meant to convey some sort of uh, duality. And I think there is a duality, but we're still trying to uncover precisely what it is. Um, the main interesting thing is that we can now see how designing algorithms for solving some problems can be used to prove impossibility results uh, for solving other problems. And uh, in this talk, I can only say like just a few of the highlights of, of what's going on in, this, in these two areas. And I encourage you to look at my survey article for more. So let's start by recalling the traditional issues in algorithms of complexity. Um, so this is a view from 50,000 feet. So in this traditional view, there are two kinds of people. Uh, in theoretical computer science, uh, there are algorithm designers and there are complexity theorists. And algorithm designers are asking what makes some problems easy to solve? When can I find an efficient algorithm for solving a problem? Okay, so I'm given some string and I want it to solve some problem. Right, where, but this, this string is encoding some, some important thing for me. Okay, the complexity theorists are trying to do something quite different. The complexity theorist is trying to say, what makes other problems difficult? Okay. When can we prove that a problem is not easy, that there's no efficient algorithm? So to enter just a little bit of jargon, when can we prove a lower bound on the resources needed to solve a problem? So we're lower bounding the number of steps, say, that any algorithm must take in solving a particular problem. Okay. So in this viewpoint, the task of the algorithm designer and the complexity theorist appear to be inherently opposite. One is trying to come up with an algorithm, the other is trying to prove no efficient algorithm exists. Okay. And this is essentially by definition. Okay. And furthermore, it's generally believe that lower bounds are harder than algorithm design. And this is just normal human intuition. Right? So in algorithm design, we only have to find some one clever algorithm that works well, uh, solve some problem well. Okay. Whereas in lower bounds, we still have to reason about all possible algorithms, <coughs> all possible efficient algorithms, even ones even some crazy ones that we maybe can't even conceive about and argue that none of them work well. None of them solve the particular problem that we want to solve. Okay? And this belief is so strongly reflected in literature as well. There are hundreds of algorithms papers published every year and very, very few concrete lower bounds papers published. Okay? Just, it seems that we're just much easier at, at solving problems given to us than showing something that can't be done. So these are all very foundational questions, and the most famous such question is P equals NP. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention it a little bit here. Um, so informally, just to recall, P equals NP is asking if verifying a solution to a problem is easy, then is finding a solution to that problem from scratch also easy. So this is just a, this is a very brief recollection of the definition. So an algorithm A runs in polynomial time, if there exists some constant k, so for all inputs of length n, so you think of them as bit strings, a runs on each input and then most into the k plus k steps. So it runs in time polynomial in the input length. And so in a problem pi is in p, we think of a problem as just a set of strings, some subset of strings. It's in p if there is a polynomial time algorithm a so for all strings. And this string is in our set pi if and only if this algorithm on that string outputs one. Let's just say it outputs a single bit zero or one. Okay. So these are these are problems that are being efficiently solved. 
P is means polynomial time. And NP stands for non-deterministic polynomial time. And so a problem phi is an NP if you can verify a solution to a problem uh, efficiently. So there's a polynomial time out of A, so that for all streams, X, and then there's sort of theorem candidates. This theorem candidate is in the problem if and only if there is some proof, Y, of polynomially related length to X, so I said this algorithm A given X and Y returns one. So whatever a string is in my problem pi, that means I have some short proof, Y, so that that witnesses that this string is in. So this algorithm A can be seen as Y is a solution to the problem X. Okay, and A is just verifying that Y is a solution. Okay. So this is just a uh, recollection of a P and NP, and it's widely conjectured. Uh, that P is different from NB, that you know, searching for a solution, like in some unstructured space, it's just going to take longer than time polynomial. Okay. And, but we have no idea how to get started solving this problem. Okay. Anyone who tells you that they do have an idea? No, they don't. Okay. So, so why are these things hard to prove? So why are we so far from resolving P well, there are many known no-go theorems, actually. So they have various technical names, relativization, natural proofs, <coughs> hybridization. I won't go into the details. At a high level, these uh, no-go theorems say that the common proof techniques are simply not good enough to prove even weak lower bounds, things very far from Peter. So not only can we not prove this stuff, but we can prove that we cannot prove this stuff. And this has led to a lot of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, a lot of pessimism and complexity here. Uh, yeah, everyone's always throwing up their hands. We can't even do X, Y, and Z. All right, so, so this talk is about some optimism in complexity theory. And it's about a particular duality that I put in quotes between algorithms and lower bounds. Dual in quotes because, again, there's no like uh, generic connection being established only in some special cases. But it may turn out the difference between algorithms and lower bounds is more psychological than anything else. Okay, so my thesis is that algorithm design for many particular problems is at least as hard as proving lower bounds. And if this thesis is true, I think of it as very good news for computational complexity because we think we understand algorithm design very well, whereas we're very far from proving lower bounds. So here we have an opportunity to learn something really new to leverage our algorithmic intuition and get some impossibility results. So not only are there deep links between these two, but in some cases they're actually the same. And, and this is you know, not a contradiction. I'm not saying that like, if, if you have an algorithm, then you can do not have an algorithm with the same problem. If you have an algorithm for some problem x, then you, get, uh, you do not have an algorithm for another problem y. And the notion of algorithm changes from, from one setting to the other. So just to give you, again, at a very high level, just the, the, the basic picture I'm trying to paint. So a typical theorem from algorithm design has the following structure. Here is some algorithm A that solves my pet problem okay, of all possible instances of the problem. So it's a worst case algorithm. Okay. It, does, it, it performs a polynomial time, solves every single instance, no matter what. Okay. A typical theorem from lower bounds says the following. Here is a proof P that my problem cannot be solved on all possible algorithms from a given class of algorithms. Okay. So what I would like to draw is an analogy between the algorithm in the top and the proof on the bottom, and instances at the top and algorithms at the bottom. And you'll see very clearly what, like how instances and algorithms relate together. So I'm going to literally take some problems for which the algorithm is the input and have another algorithm analyze it and show the algorithms which are taking this input cannot solve certain problems derived from the algorithm just analyzing it. Okay. Um, so in order to have that kind of uh, setup, I have to, I, I assume that we're at least mainly familiar with, say, the Turing style model of computation, where you have a fixed algorithm that takes inputs of arbitrary length and does something to them. So here I'll, I'll review logical circuits which are good for finite functions. So a logical circuit, uh, you know, here's a particular example. Uh, this, this one, uh, right, oh, this thing doesn't work. So there are three AND gates and an OR gate. 
Okay, they have, they have three input bits, and here this thing is outputting uh, A and B, or B and C, or B, they were A and C. Okay. So this thing takes some fine number of zero one inputs and outputs a single bit, and along the way it repeatedly takes previously computed bits and outputs a new function of these bits. Okay. So this one uh, outputs one if it only has at least two inputs at one. So we say the size of the complexity of the circuit is four, it has four gates in it. And the, the fan end of the ANS, the number of inputs of these ANS is two, and the fan end of the OR is three. Okay, these are a very natural model for computing finite functions. We have a finite discrete domain, and you have a bigger output. Right? Whereas in the Turing model of computation, you really want to say I have some algorithm just working on an infinite domain of strings and giving a, a, a finite example. So those are two different models we're going to get. Right? This is a very brief review. Alright, so, so what does this duality look like? In this talk, I'll, I'll outline a connection of the following form. Uh, so suppose I have some non-trivial circuit analysis algorithm. So this is a Turing machine. Okay? And it takes a circuit written in bits, some description of it, on input bits. So there exists some non-trivial circuit analysis algorithm. But for all circuit descriptions, this thing says something interesting some in, in some efficient amount of time. I mean, it's not polynomial time, but you know, something faster than exhaustive. So let's say it determines satisfied of okay, the circuit okay. Then I can take this uh, non trivial circuit analysis algorithm and I can construct a function, a function built up out of this Turing machine, for which, for all possible circuits, no circuit of that same kind can compute any finite slice of that function path. So, so basically we get a circuit lower bound. We get some function computable by a Turing machine, in some sense, that for which no finite slice of it can be computed by, by a circuit. Okay. So this is how we're going to take a non-trivial circuit now this algorithm and turn it to a circuit lower bound. And we can do this for like different uh, circuit analysis problems that people have widely studied and circuit lower bound problems that people have widely studied. And in fact, you can use this to actually prove unconditionally circuit lower bounds by designing new circuit analysis algorithms. All right, so in the remainder of the talk, I'll uh, outline this, uh, this problem of algorithms for circuits, then I'll talk about circuits for algorithms, I'll talk about connections between them, and then I'll outline a particular connection. Okay. So, uh, so the algorithms for circuits. Circuit analysis problems often take the following form. So your input is a logical circuit. So it's written, describing you in bits, see? And the output is some property of the function computed by the circuit. So the canonical example of this is the circuit satisfiability problem. Okay? Where you're given a logical circuit in the, of the form, you know, as I described earlier, you can think of it in general, right? It's just some DAG with ands and ors on the nodes. You've got n sources, you've got one sink, it's computing some function. So you want to decide, is the function computed by the circuit the all zeros function? Does it always output zero no matter what input you give it? Okay? So circuit set is well known to be NP-complete. I mean, it's, it's actually, that's actually the cook Levin theorem the, uh, from the 70s. But we can still ask if there are any algorithms solving circuit set that actually improve on the obvious brute force uh, so if I've got n inputs to the circuit, I can just try all two of the n possible bit strings, plug them in, and see what happens. See if any of them out makes the circuit output one. Okay. You can still ask, is there something faster than just two to the n? Right? There's a big difference between two to the n and polynomial n. And this is a problem that people have studied, uh, just trying to improve on an exhaustive search at all. It turns out it has a lot of connections to actually proving circuit lower bounds. I mean, People were initially doing it, they were just asking, is a stupid algorithm the best you can do? Turns out that getting better than a stupid algorithm has, has big implications. So we can take a more generic uh, form of the circuit set problem where instead of just looking at logical circuits in general, we can restrict the class. So we can look at Boolean formulas for which the DAG is a tree. Okay, so the output degree um, is the most one. Or they could just be arbitrary circuits. As which is arbitrary DAG, or they could be CNF formulas. So it could be, say, a big and of ORs of variables that are negations. So it's sort of a depth two circuit. Okay? 
So take any class C. We can define a CSAT problem, which is given a circuit K from this class, is there an assignment of inputs in inputs this K, just that evaluating K on these inputs makes it print one. And again, this is going to be complete for essentially all interesting circuit classes C. Again, Cook proved this in the 70s. And it's solvable in 2 to the n times the size of the circuit pack, just exhaustively searching through all 2 to the n possible right. And again, we can try and see in what cases can we actually improve on over 2 to the n. This is, in general, the outcomes for circuits kind of question. So for simple enough circuits, we know faster than 2 to the n algorithms, actually. Uh, so for the 3 sat problem, which is still going to be complete, we know, uh, for example, 1.3 to the n of the time. So, so 3 sat, it, the circuit will have the following form. So n of a whole bunch of ores, and each ore has span at most 3. And these ores can touch either you know, uh, variables or their negations. Okay, so this is typically called conjunctive normal form, 3, 3 C and F. Um, and in fact, in that case, you can improve over 2 to the n. For 4 sat, you can also get improvement, but it's slightly worse. For K sat, you can get improvement, but it's also slightly worse. You can get roughly 2 to the n minus n over K as K keeps growing. So this is the work of many, many different authors. And so all known C to the n time elements for K sat have a property that as K goes to infinity, this constant C, this base of the exponent, converges to 2. And in fact, this is some phenomena for many different kinds of algorithms, so like local search. So you start with a random assignment. It doesn't work. You try to fix it because there's some, some or is not satisfied. You, you try to fix it in some random way. You do some random walk through the space. It, it will take this much time. You backtrack. You start with no assignment at all. You pick a variable. You try to set it to a value 0 or 1. You try to be clever about how you set it. Nevertheless, it still seems to take this much time. And dynamic programming solutions at that, and so on. They all seem to take about this much time. And so there's this thing called the strong exponential time hypothesis, which posits that essentially 2 to the n is the best you can do. So you take any delta less than 1, so like 0 0.99999. There exists some constant k, because that k set requires uh, 2 to the 0 0.9999 in time. Okay. So this basically says this k goes to infinity, 2 is the best you want to get. Okay. And then there's an exponential time hypothesis, which says, because you can also ask, OK, for 3 sat, you know, it started maybe 1.6 to the n, 1.5 to the n, 1.4. Is this sequence of decreasing bases of exponents ever going to you know, converge to 1? Exponential time hypothesis says this is not going to happen. It's not going to converge to 1. So there's some positive delta to that 3 sat requires to the delta. So you've heard quite a bit about the unique games conjecture, uh, if you were attending some of these, uh, the Lena Price talks and so on. And the, it's generally a lot of work. Uh, the strong exponential time hypothesis has been sort of my motivator for the past five years. I think pretty much every uh, interesting result I have proved in the past five years has been trying to refute the strong exponential time hypothesis, failing and getting it something else to say, including the lower bounds of this work. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, I, I think it's definitely false, but, I, but it's really hard to like all the algorithmic techniques we, we have seem to uh, fail. Okay, so, uh, so the, as you sort of make the circuit classes more and more general, so going away from like just an and of course, you can still get better than exalted search, but the, the bounds get worse. So, so for this class AC0, where instead of just having, say, an and of course, like in 3 set, you have constant depth and or not. So you have some constant number of layers and or not gates. So like here, the, the depth of this circuit is, is 3. Okay. Um, so as, as you increase the depth, you can, it's, it's a constant. You can still get something better than 2 to the n. But that improvement over 2 to the n gets worse and worse as uh, your depth d increases. But if your size stays you know, roughly polynomial, you'll have some log factor in your denominator. Yeah. Um, so, so you can still improve over exhaustive search, but it's, it's not as good as, as you have with, say, 3 sat and k sat. And 
So there's another circuit class, um, which is very interesting because essentially no lower bounds were known for it. So this is constant depth circuits with and or not in a funny gate called mod n. So for the purpose of this talk, think of the depth as 3 and n is equal to 6. And a mod 6 gate will just simply compute the divisibility of the sum of its inputs. So you're given a bunch of zeros and ones, you want to know if the sum is divisible by 6. So these are your gates. You have constant number layers. You have three layers. It looks something like this. And as far as we knew, essentially like these, these uh, silly little uh, circuits could compute practically any function, okay? even say polynomial size. And the reason why I mean six is because okay, smallest composite does not require power, and the well, and the known uh, lower bound techniques. They did some sort of mapping of circuits over to finite fields, and there's no field with size 6, and so this is where the techniques break down, just to give you um, a rough idea of, of why this is you know, some difficult uh, class of computations to understand. So I, I'd love to tell you about like um, how you can get a set out of this thing. So, so what you can show is that ACC set is in to the n minus n the E time for circuits of sub-exponential size for some constant E depending on this uh, M in your mod 6, 6 and the depth. So, okay. so you can get some improvement over exhaustive search. And this turns out to be extremely useful for proving lower bounds against this class ACC for which there were none. Um, so I'll just tell you the ingredients behind this algorithm. This is very, very different from anything you, I mean, that has been used, like say backtracking and um, local search and the usual paradigms that people have to solve these kinds of comic world problems. So one was a known representation of ACC via polynomials. So basically Yao and Beagle and Curry showed that every ACC function, so every function could be viewable by a small entity circuit, can be put in the following form. It can be written as a G of H's, where H is a multilinear polynomial with K monomials. Okay? And over all zero one assignments, it evaluates something between 0 and k, where k is not too large. So it's sort of quasi-polynomial on the circuit size. So if the size were s, it's like s to the polylog s, k is. Okay. And then this g is just some arbitrary look of k. So this, this decomposition result says that if you've got an ACC circuit, you can decompose into this something which is close to a multilinear polynomial, but not quite. Okay. And then we use a fast Fourier transform for multilinear polynomials to evaluate this H on all of its possible assignments and several other little tricks to get a faster set out. I just want to sort of tell you some of the ingredients going into it so, so you can see that this is very different from just uh, local search and backtracking from the usual ways you might try to solve set. So going further, you can try to look at, say, the Morgan formulas, which are formulas over and or not. So these are, again, like trees. Circuits are tree-like over and or not. And there are some improvements there, sort of slightly improved algorithms, that actually match the known lower bounds. So the best known lower bound for the Morgan formulas is about cubic. And so this can get right up to uh, a cubed. And similar for formulas over uh, n or not x or. Now, for this generic circuit set problem over n or not, it's open whether we can actually do better than just the exhaustive search algorithm which tries all through the end possible assignments and on a circuit of size s and just evaluates in roughly s time. We, we have no improvement whatsoever over that. Now, I think this is a very interesting question. We will, we'll see more about why it's interesting. So, so that's all I'm going to say uh, about circuit analysis algorithms. Now I'll talk about circuit complexity. So, so circuit complexity is a way of trying to um, take infinite languages, so functions that are usually computable by Turing machines, and talk about what it means for circuits to compute. Okay? So what we'll do is we'll allow a distinct logical circuit to run on inputs of length n. Okay? So you have a circuit of uh, a sub 100 for, for inputs of length 100, a sub 1,000 for inputs of length 1,000, and so on. So you have an infinite family of circuits, you have an infinite computational model. And so what happens is, you can think of it as, when I get an input of length, 
say 10,000, I feed it to A sub 10,000. Okay, that, that's certain. And it will outcome okay. So P poly is a class of problems efficiently solvable by such circuit families. So they're solvable with some infinite family A sub n, such that there exists some constant k for all n, the size of A sub n, the number of gates in it, is at most into the k. So, e, so the, the size of these things are, are scaling the following number, okay, even though it's an infinite number. But this is an infinite computational model, and so there are some undecidable problems which are actually computable in P poly. And the usual techniques of computability theory are essentially powerless for trying to understand this. Thing. Even though the definition of it gives you some nice way of talking about size uh, computation trade-offs between things. So like, how big does a circuit need to be in order to compute a certain function? Um, the computability theory is essentially useless in trying to understand this. Thing, just because things become undecided when we have an infinite uh, description of the computation. So most Boolean functions require huge circuits. Okay, if you pick a, a function at random, it will require a circuit of size at least roughly 2 to the n over n. This is a simple counting argument. You just count the number of circuits and number of Boolean functions. So the question in circuit algorithms are what normal algorithms can be simulated to be things which aren't random functions, but things which are sort of computable by Turing machines. Okay. The thing is, non-uniformity can be very, very powerful. You just don't understand how powerful it can be. So a major problem is whether the gigantic complexity class NX is contained in the small circuit class P poly. Okay. So this is basically asking, so you've heard of NP, you have polynomially long solutions, verifiable in polynomial time. NX is going to have exponentially long solutions, verifiable exponential time. So it's basically saying get all problems with exponentially long solutions to them, we solve a polynomial size circuit families. So we think no way, right? Exponentials are much bigger than polynomials, so this is like it would just be absurd if this were true. However, in one case you have a finite algorithm doing the verification, and in another case you have an infinite circuit family. So we really just don't know. So another way of thinking is given infinite preprocessing time, can one construct these small size circuits solving NX problems? And this is just a um, this is just one of these questions that like we're we, we really don't know. I mean, we think absolutely the answer must be no. And um, so basically the, the point of this work is to show an avenue for trying to finally prove this. So uh, a major conjecture is that NP is not NP poly, but this is only stronger actually than proving P different than NP. So uh, we don't really uh, expect to make progress on that thing. But when you think that, say, the SAT problem is not in poly And what we get from proving a certain class is not in poly that a problem is in poly is that it should yield concrete trade-offs about the size of inputs versus the size of computations. Such as, you know, things like every logical circuit solving all SAT distances on 10 to the 8 calls requires 10 to the 60 gates. This is, this is an information that you should be able to extract from the proof of such a lower bound. Because you're talking about how the size of the circuit scale as your input gets large. Okay. These questions have very interesting consequences regardless of how they resolve. Um, so if exponential time happened to be contained in P poly for whatever reason, then we would actually be able to prove that P is in from NP. Great. And it's probably not going to happen. But okay, fine. So we can in fact say that every problem in say to the order in time has circuits just slightly smaller than 1.9 in size, then P is in from NP. Okay. Great. On the other hand, if X is not in P poly, which is what we so propose as the case, exponential time is probably not going to have polynomial size three, then we get pseudorandom generators. We get ways of just generically taking randomized algorithms and making them deterministic. So a uh, famous theorem of Impaliozo and Vickerson along these lines says that if some problem to the order in time needs circuit families larger than 1.9 in size, then P equals B. So any randomized polynomial time algorithm can be efficiently converted to a deterministic polynomial. Okay. In fact, we have some sort, some similar consequences for NX time. So now I'll talk about some of the connections that are between these two things. So analysis for circuits, or circuit analysis, 
we're designing faster circuit analysis algorithms. So we're trying to take an algorithm which, which will take an arbitrary circuit input and say something interesting about the circuit no matter what it is. In circuits for algorithms, we're trying to design small circuits to simulate complex algorithms or prove that no small circuits exist. So can we use one of these tasks to inform the other tasks? So, one is, so if we're thinking that there are no small circuits, then one is a lower bound task, and the other, other one, algorithms for circuits, is an algorithm design task. So, so the interesting direction is whether circuit analysis algorithms tell us anything about the limitations of circuits. So is, is this possible? Because, again, we think we understand algorithms very, very well, and we think we don't understand lower bounds at all. So this is an implication in the counterintuitive direction. So we can get something from just taking the contraposite of something I told you a moment ago. Suppose we had extremely efficient circuit analysis algorithms. Then we could prove that there are problems solvable by algorithm to the end time that are not in the okay? So this is just the contraposite of what I was saying here. So, it, so before I said, if x is contained in p poly, you think from np. If p equals np, so this means you have perfect circuit analysis, right? You have circuit set in polynomial time, you have all these other problems in polynomial time, then there are problems in exponential time, which are not in p poly. Okay. So the, this is an interesting conditional statement, however, it has limited utility, because we don't believe the hypothesis to be true. We don't believe p equals np. But you can think about this and try to say, well, look, suppose I were to relax the hypothesis from p equals np some algorithm I might hope to obtain, then can I still prove a circuit lower bound? And that's exactly um, what, we, what we do. So what we show is a slightly faster algorithm for circuit set, not polynomial time, it's a slightly faster than the circuit, will imply circuit lower bounds. So just to give some pictures, suppose you have a circuit from some generic class that has size into the C that's in inputs, suppose you can inspect the circuit, okay, and somehow find out an input which makes the circuit current one. Okay. And do this not in 2 to the n times n to the c, which would be exhaustive switch. So we have 2 to the n over n to the 10. Now let's suppose you can do this no matter what the constant c is. So for every constant c, you can get an algorithm which does this. So just a slight improvement on the exhaustive switch. Right? Not all on n, 2 to the n over n to the 10. The 10 is just some arbitrarily large constant. You know, maybe 4 will work. Okay. So then, given the same class of circuits, Okay. We can find a function in, in x, not in terms of exponential time, which is not compatible with that class. Okay. In particular, if the class is polynomial size circuits, we have proved that x is not in okay. So a slightly faster algorithm than the circuit set problem implies lower bounds against okay. So what's, why might this thing even be true? Okay. So there's two different ways of looking at it. One is that faster circuit set algorithms are uncovering a weakness in computing with circuits. Okay. So basically, this circuit cannot hide an input which makes it print one for me very easily. So somehow I can, it's, it's weaker than a black box. If I, if I could not actually look at the description of the circuit, I'm forced to take two the end time. Right? I don't just query the input output behavior. I would have to take two the end steps. So that the circuit can simply be adversarial. So by, but by looking at the description, I can improve over that. So somehow there's, this circuit cannot hide an input which makes it print one from my algorithm. Okay. So that's so it's some weakness in the view of it. There's like some sort of cryptographic weakness. Okay. Another intuition is that faster circuit set algorithms are uncovering a strength in less than exponential algorithms. So here's a problem that you can do in less than 2 the end time that, I didn't, that you didn't think you could do, namely finding an input which makes the circuit print one. So we're showing that less than exponential time algorithms are strong in some interesting respect. And these circuit classes are weak. They can't hide uh, satisfying inputs from us. And so we hope to separate the two. Okay, we hope to show that, I mean, we have to throw in non-determinism to get the proof to work. But, uh, but that, that's, the, that's the, the rough idea. Okay. okay, so slightly more formally. Uh, so there's actually just a very generic connection for different circuit classes. If I have an algorithm for circuit set that runs in slightly less than 2 the end time, that implies an x is not a plot. Okay? If I instead can't do it for circuits with just formulas, tree-like circuits, then I get an x does not have polynomial size formula families. Formally, this is just an x does not have an NC1. It's just a notation. 
Okay. If I have a certain, if I have uh, ACC set out, it runs faster. I get an X does not have eight like uh, polynomial size ACC families. So you can imagine a different ACC circuit for each of the things. Um, and in fact, we don't have to solve the SAT problem. We just have to solve the following promise problem. So if I give you a circuit and I promise that it's either unsatisfiable, so no input will make it the right one, or half its assignments are satisfied. Okay, you just want to determine which is the case in less than two to the end time. If you have random, this, this is trivial. You just pick a random assignment. Okay? If, it's, if it's the unset case, you'll always have zeros in the output. But if it's half the assignments are satisfied, you're bound to get something that makes it print one. Okay? So I want to do this not with randomness, but deterministically. Suppose you can do this. So this is just some, you know, very, this is a problem we definitely believe can be done uh, faster than it's on the search. In that case, you still can prove this big of a problem that NX is not. Um, let's see. So I'm going to skip to just talking about this outline of connection. So, so I'll just, in the remaining time, I'll tell you just in a very kind of how faster set algorithms imply lower bounds. Okay? So this is sort of a generic statement. Uh, C sat of circuits with n inputs and poly size is in less than 2 n time, and x was brought in C. Okay? So what I'm going to do uh, with the time I have is to show you the much simpler implication that if P was NP, then X was not NP poly. Okay? So, so if you have a perfect circuit analysis out with, if circuit sets in polynomial time, you can get a lower bound. Okay? So we assume P equals NP, and X does contain NP poly, and we want to prove a contradiction. Okay? So if X is NP poly, then there exist polynomial size circuits encoding accepting, accepting computation histories. And what this means is that for every exponential time machine M, in every string x, if I have, there's a circuit which given m, the description of m, x, and an i and a j, it will print the content of the j itself of this machine, m running on x, in the i step of the computation. Okay? So you think of some big table with entries, you know, i and j, so you're just printing like all the content printed by this machine. There's some circuit that will encode this huge table. The behavior of this machine, M on X, can be simulated generically as follows. We just guess the circuit non-deterministically. So we just guess it. And then for all I and all J, we check that this circuit is making consistent claims about the tape content uh, in the vicinity of cell I and cell J. Okay? Basically, this happens because on a Turing machine, computation is local. Right? And from one step, you can only move one cell to the left and one cell to the right. And so in order to verify the whole computation, it suffices to just sort of look in the vicinity, the step before, the step after, and the cells around you that you're actually being consistent with the transition function. Okay? So but this is a polynomial size existential guess and a polynomial size universal guess. So this inner part is computable in Killing feet. It's universal quantifier, polynomial size on a polynomial time computation. P equals NP implies that we can just change that to something polynomial time. But this, now we have something which is an NP problem. Existential guess or by polynomial time. So B equals NP means that this whole thing is actually simulatable in polynomial time. So now we have a big problem. We took an exponential time computation, an arbitrary one, and we simulated in polynomial time. This contradicts the so-called time hierarchy here. It says that as you strictly increase the time it takes to solve problems, then there are strictly more problems that you can solve. You can always find some problem in exponential time that cannot be solved in polynomial time. And the, to get that slightly faster circuit set implies uh, um, NX does not have polynomial size circuits, you take something like this and you put it on steroids and you go like 10 more pages of slides and, and you get that. Okay. This is just hopefully you just get some idea of this. So, uh, so how are we going to make future progress? One is to find simpler functions for which circuit analysis implies circuit lower bounds, right? It's really annoying that what we have is that faster circuit set implies that this function of nx does not have small circuits. nx is a huge class, right? Exponential long solutions verified exponential time. 
I mean, even reducing it to just exponential time, the optimal alternative seems hard. To get that, we may have to improve on exhaustive search for more complex problems. So we think of circuits as a complex problem, but from the point of view of circuit analysis, it's actually the most basic one. We want to know if the circuit is computing a trivial function. Is it all zeros or not? Right? So, so maybe faster counting of satisfying assignments, not just detecting if there is one, but counting them explicitly, maybe that implies that x does not have to be this, this is something we're still working on. Trying to understand how better circuit analysis implies a little about stronger rule. Another one is just trying to find faster algorithms for circuit satisfiability. Uh, this is something I think is, is very doable. So here's an open problem that I think can be tackled. Suppose I have a Boolean formula of size s. So it's just a tree-like formula, and it's orthodox, and it has s gates in it. Can you evaluate it on all n variable assignments in time polynomial on s times 2 to the n times poly n time? Okay, so naively, we take 2 to the n times poly s time. I right, just try all possible assignments and plug them in and see what happens. But now, I want to separate sort of the size from the, the 2 to the n. If you, you can do this for ACC, and it's precisely why we can prove lower bounds against ACC. Can you do it for formulas? If so, we have formula lower bounds. And in general, um, I would just encourage you to find more connections between algorithms and lower bounds. They're definitely there, and uh, it's, it's pretty productive for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. 